Guru Nation, welcome to episode 158 of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. Yes, I'm sick. I'm a little congested actually. Feeling better today than yesterday, but uh, not 100%, but that does not matter. The show must go on. And matter of fact, today we had a monster marathon of a day um, from the CRO side actually. We, helped, we sat down with a research naive sponsor they're actually working on some pretty cool things um, in the diagnostics space and uh, they asked us to do something that we we've never really done before and you know uh, the more I'm thinking about it the more I'm looking at this industry the more I'm seeing that this industry is full of specialists and not really very many um, generalists. So I'm trying to be a generalist. Chris is trying to be a generalist. You know, we started out at the research site level years ago, over a decade ago now. Uh, I started full time, if you don't know my story, I started out full time as a research site owner. Uh, from 2006, I started owning sites. From 05, I worked as a coordinator uh, until probably 2012, so I'm very familiar with the site side. I still continue to own sites. I don't think that's ever going to stop. But two years ago, we started getting into consulting. And shortly after that, it started evolving into CRO work. And then I wanted to learn the process of that, so I went out and got a contract CRA gig. By the way, while maintaining everything else, so I'm just adding more to my workload, uh, and we're even starting to perhaps do some equity deals, which this LinkedIn sign behind me, and I'm gonna working on for those listening on the podcast, you go to YouTube. I'm covering up all the equity deals that we're working on right now with sponsors, meaning we want to own a piece of the sponsor company right they're not all gonna say yes most say no and from the ones that say yes they're not all gonna succeed but some will right and so we're, we're really trying to it's gonna behoove us to be generalists and uh, I'm noticing that you know in this industry people could spend decades in this industry but just working on just a certain segment of clinical research and never truly have a full understanding of everything in clinical research and I don't know if that'll ever be possible for somebody to understand every single aspect of research or to be an expert in every single aspect but I'm striving to be a generalist now because I'm really good at the site stuff I consider myself an expert on the site level things I'm starting to get familiar with the CRO and CRA's uh, world Um, sponsors I've got a lot to learn, but that's obviously the next decade of my career is going to be spent doing that while maintaining all this other stuff. So today what we did with this client is we whiteboarded, not on this whiteboard, on another one, and I have it in front of me. I have the picture in front of me so I could go through it and kind of give you an overview, podcast listeners and YouTube viewers, um, some insight into what we were doing because I think this is much needed in the industry so we without getting into study specifics this is a diagnostics company and so I say that because I want to give you context so there's some differences but the process is the same no matter if you're a drug maker a diagnostics maker or a device maker the process is the same but you can omit certain things if you don't have an investigational product but a diagnostic instead right uh... and again don't take this as legal advice get yourself a regulatory affairs person get yourself a darshan kulkarni the guy's amazing um, but things like an investigation investigator brochure obviously doesn't apply to a diagnostics company but i'm still gonna make it general enough to where Anybody, no matter what you're working on, um, can get a general idea for the schematics of clinical research, really. Okay, so the first thing, the very first thing you got to do, let's say you have the idea 
or you have like a prototype or you have a, a molecule that you want to test you have a device you want to test you have a diagnostic you have a behavioral um, uh, a behavioral therapy that you're trying to get uh, or that you want to test I mean whatever the case may be you got to design the study you have to have a study design and the way I look at it uh, is you've got the study and protocol design okay then you have everything in between which is the operations of the study from site selection till study closeout which is what I'm an expert in me and Chris and then you have the back end of that of the uh, data um, submission to the FDA and the, and the study submission to the FDA so the two bookends are the think of it like a book okay you got the study design and protocol design and you got regulatory affairs coming into play there then you got the operations which is where DSCS comes into play and then you've got the back end of the bookend which is the data and study submission which you bring in the regulatory affairs again okay and then you get the FDA involved again so I'm gonna try to go through all of that with you right now during this um, podcast so the first thing you do you do a study design alright so this is where regulatory affairs come into play this is where you've got um, project manager study director biostatistician regulatory affairs a medical monitor perhaps a protocol writer and somebody from the FDA uh, that you want to have early exploratory conversations with so you can have you can actually have conversations with the FDA while you're designing your study so that you can know whether your study is going to be something that the FDA will approve or not. So you don't want to waste all your time working on a protocol and then the FDA says, no, this is not, you know, this is not what we're actually going to be looking for in, the, in your trial. This is what you need to include in there. And I'm oversimplifying, of course, but you should have these early conversations with the FDA. So FDA consultations. Uh, simultaneously, you should start looking at IRBs okay because you're gonna need an IRB to approve the protocol and then you're gonna need an IRB to work with the sites especially the uh, the sites that can use central IRB will work with your IRB there are some sites that need local IRB and they'll work with their IRBs but the IRB needs to approve the protocol as well so you want to have these early conversations with IRBs while you're designing your study as well okay and then while you're doing that as you start getting more concrete information from the FDA, from the IRB about what needs to go into the study design and what you need to consider, then you can start doing the protocol design. So once you start doing the protocol design, uh, the same people, again, you're getting the project manager involved. At this stage in the game, the project manager is really making sure everyone's meeting timelines, making sure the right people are getting paid, all this stuff costs money, by the way. So project managers in charge of making sure these things are running smoothly. But you've got regulatory affairs, biostatisticians, protocol writers, medical monitors, study director. Um, they are getting involved at this point as well. Um, tracking uh, manages workflow, directs the project manager. So study director most sponsors have study directors, project managers, biostatisticians, regulatory affairs, medical monitors, protocol writers, all in-house. If you're a small device company, diagnostics company, you may not have these people, so you may need to bring in contractors to do this, or you may want to start considering developing some of these people in-house. Okay, so once you got the protocol design, you need to apply for an IND, that's an investigational new drug, application if it's a device I'm not sure this is where we got to get regulatory affairs and people like their Sean on or if it's a diagnostics I don't know if there's an equivalent to that to an IND out there for device and diagnostics companies uh, if anyone out there knows let me know again I'm learning as I go with these things uh, but you do need an IND uh, for uh, 
for the pharmaceuticals, uh, for the investigational products. Then you got to start looking at um, creating a investigator brochure if it's a drug. If it's a diagnostic or a device, I think there's an equivalent to that. And wherever we weren't sure of, of the things, we list them anyways, and we put a question mark. So we know that for a drug, you need an IND and you need an investigator brochure. We weren't sure about a device I'm pretty sure a device needs that as well, but we weren't sure about a diagnostics because in this case we were working with a diagnostic company. So we put a question mark there and that's a question for somebody like their Sean, somebody from regulatory affairs. Um, then you've got to, uh, once you get a protocol, once it's approved by the FDA and the IRB, you want to submit it on clinicaltrials.gov. You'll get fined if you don't. You're supposed to at least. Um, and then you can put the status as not yet enrolling. When you start screening, then you can put screening. Okay, so somebody, typically the study director will uh, list the study on clinicaltrials.gov. Vendor selection occurs at this point as well as site recruitment. So seeking out sites. I'm an expert in this. I'm starting to get like very familiar with the stuff now. So vendor selection, what kind of vendors do you need? You need an EDC, electronic data capture system. You need an IWRS. You need a lab. You need a CTMS. You need patient reported outcomes. All right, these are some of the things you need. You need a trial master file. Um, the, you may want to consider recruitment vendors. I consider an IRB a vendor. We need an IRB by this point. So this is when you start getting the vendors lined up. Okay, lab kit supply. Who's doing the logistics? Usually it's project manager, but sometimes there's a vendor to do the to do the logistics for all this. ECG vendor. Okay, these are the um, central rating scales for psychiatric trials. So there's could be tons of vendors. This is where the vendor procurement comes into play, and that's the project manager as well as the study director. Now you get into the uh, site recruitment. So start looking for potential sites. And ideally, and by the way, a big vendor for a sponsor to consider is a CRO, which is what DSCS is, which in, in this case, this is the role we were playing is a CRO. But again, a lot of these sponsors are bringing their CRO activities in-house. Okay, so CRO is no longer a necessary vendor. It never was necessary. There's no regulation that said sponsors must use CROs, but it was a practical, the most practical way of executing a trial and, and now in 2018 that's less likely the case now it's a lot of it's coming back in-house to pharma and to the sponsors so a CRO is also one of the big vendors here okay and sometimes the CRO helps with all of these things I've mentioned and sometimes they just do certain things depending on what the sponsor needs again this is why boutique CROs are in fashion again <sighs> Got a sip of water, got to stay hydrated. Okay, so site recruitment. So this is where the CROs could have a competitive advantage. CROs have databases of PIs that they've worked with in the past. In the case of DSCS, we actually have, we go a step further. We have influence over these sites. We are consultants for a whole bunch of sites across the country, actually across the world now. And so we have influence with these sites. So we can get 30 sites up and running relatively quickly. That's one of our core competencies. We also are very good at finding research naive sites that have large patient populations for the specific indications, a lot of rare diseases. And then we train those sites on doing research. We hold their hands, do a lot of babysitting, a lot of hand holding. It's a lot of dirty work that the big CROs don't want to do, nor do they have the time to do. We have the time, the staff, this is where everything ties in. Our consulting, our CRA Academy, everything's sort of tying in together here. So you need to recruit sites, you need to find PIs that can do the study. So how does that work? Well, you got to send out, first of all, you got to identify potential sites. Then you got to send out the CDA and the feasibility questionnaire. 
and usually a protocol synopsis for the site to have an understanding of the uh, study. Okay, somebody looks at the feasibilities, usually it's the project manager, study director, and then they will determine which sites they want to potentially go do site selection visits for. So they filter out the sites that they're not going to use based on the feasibility responses and the sites that they will use, and they'll schedule site selection visits. Sometimes the site selection visits can occur remotely, like through telephone. Other times it's in person, depending on the complexity of the study. In the case of my client, it looks like they could be remote uh, site selection visits, but oftentimes they're in person. So the monitors at this point get involved. This is where the monitors now start getting involved. The CRO and the sponsor develop or procure which CRAs will be in charge of which sites and who's going to do site selection visits. Then they go out and do it. The CRAs write their site selection visit reports. They submit them to the trial master file. The team lead, the project manager, the lead CRA will review the reports. They'll determine which sites are selected. Then the in-house CRAs typically get involved and will send the startup regulatory documents to the sites that have been selected. These are the 1572 forms, financial disclosure forms, IRB submissions. Each site needs to submit IRB and get IRB approval, protocol signature page, investigator brochure signature page, and then they'll send them all the reg binders too. Like, But that's not part of the startup regulatory. That's just prior to the site initiation visit. So let's not get too ahead of ourselves now. Uh, simultaneously, somebody from contracts, could be the project manager, but at these bigger CROs or sponsors, it's contracts and budgets people, will send budgets and contracts to the sites and we start the negotiation process for getting a fully executed contract and budget with each site. This is a lot of work. This is, sounds, I'm making it sound simple, it's a lot of work going on here. There's a lot of money being lost in this part of a study, in the startup phase. A lot of delays. Every day that a clinical trial goes on is like a cost a million dollars to the sponsor on average. Might be pushing two now. Um, so speed, time, this that speed is of the essence and sites need to get these things done quickly so they can start screening quickly and sponsors need to get these things done quickly so they can start getting patients and getting that data so that they can end the studies sooner, okay? Once the sites have the budgets contracts and the startup regulatory is done, then they do the uh, kickoff meeting. So it's a kickoff meeting, and that's between the CROs and the sponsors, where they will internally go through who's all involved, what the responsibilities are from the sponsor and CRO side, who the vendors are, Sometimes they introduce the vendors to everybody. And then there's an investigator meeting. And these can occur either in person at some location or increasingly common now is uh, remotely, so webinars. Okay. So at the investigator meetings, the sponsor CRO, the vendors, and all the sites, the PIs and the coordinators, come in, talk about the study, we just did a video on investigator meetings. They'll train the sites on the studies. They'll introduce the sites to the vendors. They'll share. They'll try to share best practices and strategies for recruitment, retention, things like that. Uh, then they ship the um, IP or the diagnostic or whatever it is that they're going to be using to the sites. Okay. Then they send the full regulatory binder. They send all the lab kits. Uh, they will send the um, ECG machine, anything else that the site needs to complete the study. They will this at this point the sites will also get access to IWRS, EDC. They've got to do the training on all these things. So we're still in startup phase. Okay, this is still time is money here, right and an average of 10 vendors per study. A lot. There's a lot to do here from the site's uh, perspective. This is why sites should negotiate a startup fee in their contracts because this is taking a lot of time and they haven't screened one patient yet. 
Matter of fact, they haven't even pre-screened one patient yet. So all this stuff happens prior to the SIV. Now at the SIV, which we're having here at my clinic on Monday, uh, site initiation visit, the CRA comes out to do the site initiation visit. They train on the protocol. They make sure the delegation of duties log is completed. They make sure everyone has their, everyone who's on the delegation log has their GCP, CV, medical license, IATA, all the appropriate essential documents. They make sure in the reg binder filed, they make sure and they, they take copies of these things for the trial master file. Uh, they make sure that the sites have the supplies, the IP, the diagnostic. They make sure that everyone has access to all the platforms and the vendors that they're going to be using. After the SIV, the sites are either ready to screen or they're not, and they're given action items to complete prior to given the green light to start screening. Okay, now let's assume the sites get initiated. Now they start recruiting study participants. And now the fun begins because this is where if you thought study startup was plagued with delays, you should see the enrollment part of the study. All right. Most sites overestimate how many patients they're going to screen. Sponsors, savvy sponsors know this. Naive sponsors don't and get caught off guard. Uh, spoiler alert most studies are behind on recruitment so if you're a research naive sponsor just assume that the, your sites are overestimating their recruitment capabilities uh, okay this is where you might want to get your recruitment vendor if you have a recruitment vendor or your recruitment strategy um, rolling and uh, there's most recruitment vendors are mediocre at best and expensive is the normal okay expensive is the norm so enrollment screening happens here randomization also happens there's a special kind of monitoring visit called a booster visit so if sites are not recruiting at all or significantly less than they anticipated the CRAs are sent out to do a booster visit to encourage sites to get their enrollment up. Like, what's going on? Here I have another site who's doing really well. These are some of the things they're doing. Maybe you can do this, right? They're just trying to encourage the sites. First, they try to figure out why. What's the reason? Is it because you don't have the patience? Or is it because you're too busy to pre-screen? Both are, I, both are very common. So find out why first and then solve the problem. If you don't know why, you don't know which problem you're solving. And that's the problem I see with a lot of these CRAs when they come out for their booster visits is they just start speaking in cliches because they're not even trying to find out what the problem is. They're just coming out with canned answers as to here's some strategies, generic strategies that work. Well, what a, what a tremendous waste of time. You don't even know why the site's not recruiting. Maybe they don't need help recruiting, they just don't have the time. And then you can bring somebody or you can encourage the site to bring on um, assistance. I've seen sponsors hire people for the sites to help them pre-screen. The sponsor pays for these people. So figure out why. That's uh, just a side note here. Let's not get too sidetracked. Uh, first patient in. So once the patient comes in, is enrolled, the CRA will usually, within two weeks of that, go to that site, every single site is the same thing, and make sure that they monitor and make sure that there's no errors, deviations, because you don't want that site to keep committing these errors. And then a CRA goes out and monitors. So they have each site, whenever a site randomizes a subject, the CRA will go within two weeks to make sure that the uh, site is doing everything okay. okay. And then there's also a retention strategy that needs to be done during this uh, portion. The sites typically are, obviously they're incentivized to retain the subjects because sites get paid based on patient visits. So 
and the sponsors need retention because they need the data, they need that long-term data for safety and efficacy purposes. So retention comes in here, okay? Uh, this is ongoing, on an ongoing basis. The, the monitoring plan here uh, depends on the type of monitoring that will be used. If it's traditional monitoring, it's usually every six weeks, and it's 100% source data verification. It could be on-site, or it could be remote monitoring. Depends. If it's risk-based monitoring, it could be on-site or remote monitoring, but it does not have to be 100% SDV, source data verification. It could be different for every site based on their risk profile, hence the name risk-based monitoring. So that's the monitoring plan. The monitors will follow that plan those plans could be adaptive as in risk-based monitoring. Uh, then there's data analysis. So there's interim database locks. There are uh, data reconciliation. Basically this is where the data will be analyzed every quarter or every six months depending on again the study design. And they're going to look at the biostatisticians and the medical monitor and the sponsor is going to look at the data at intervals and say, okay, is the drug working? Is the device working? Is the diagnostic working? Do we need to pull the plug on this study? Are we showing efficacy? What's the safety looking like? Are there any changes we need to make? Even the IRB gets involved at this point too because if there's a lot of SAEs going on, the IRB may want changes to the protocol as well because the IRBs are concerned about patient safety. So. Data analysis is important, and it's one of the benefits of doing risk-based monitoring. It's one of the benefits of having EDC system. Site communications go on during this uh, phase as well. Updates, newsletters, strategies. Uh, they try to incentivize sites to keep up the recruitment efforts. Uh, sites can get bogged down with mundane tasks. Sites can be working on other studies that are competing with yours and maybe pay better or maybe are easier or maybe they like the monitor better I mean there's a lot of variables as to why sites might give up on a study and that's not good you as a sponsor are concerned with getting the sites to give their full effort on your study it's your responsibility as the sponsor to do so and to fix the problem before it becomes a problem and before it starts affecting your bottom line then there's a, another uh, milestone last patient in this is when you shut down the IWRS when you reached your enrollment target you stop the IWRS so it prevents sites from enrolling new subjects because if you only need 300 patients you don't want number 301 and 302 and 303 to sneak in there you want to stop at 300 because you don't want to waste that extra money that's you have to pay those sites for that then you notify the sites of this and you should be notifying them on an ongoing basis when enrollment is projected to end uh, then you'll do the last patient visit then they'll do the final database lock to do a final database reconciliation they'll schedule the closeout visits they'll collect the IP the device the diagnostics they'll get their ECG machine back uh, they will look at the site's archiving plan uh, some sponsors just take the study records back themselves and store it in-house most sponsors rely on the sites to keep the records so most sites use Iron Mountain but just make sure that the sites are aware that they need to keep the records for X number of years and X could be anywhere from 5 to 50 I've seen both extremes okay data submission this is where I am no longer an expert, uh, but I'm trying to get uh, to become a generalist on this this phase of the the opposite bookend of this book. All right, so uh, the data submission. Once all the data is in, databases are locked, sites are closed out. The biostatisticians, medical monitors, who regulatory affairs people get involved again. The same people who worked on the study design and the protocol development now get involved again and they package the data study data to the FDA 
and then they await for FDA response. And the FDA can say, this is good, it's approved, or it's not. You need to go back to the drawing board, or you need to do a smaller study um, because we forgot to, or you, or we are unsure whether this particular endpoint was met clearly, so you got to redo this part. The, it could be a number of things. And again, I'm no expert there, but that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, hopefully, it was helpful. Um, let me know if not, but again, I'm trying to become a generalist. Part of doing this podcast and YouTube video is sharing my journey as I learn more with you. Um, and you may not want to be a generalist. doesn't matter. You, you, hopefully you found something from here that you can uh, take home and apply to your business uh, or to your career, whatever that may be. So thank you for sticking by with me today, uh, despite the congested sound. And uh, hope to hear from you all later. Take care.